So we heard quite a lot about conversations kind of earlier this morning. Um, I've been having a slightly different conversation, uh, so a national conversation, it's a national conversation on immigration. Um, so it's actually the biggest public engagement that's ever been done on immigration. Um, so I'm working together with British Future, um, who are a think tank who do a lot of work on kind of immigration and integration. Um, so together it, it's kind of it's a big investigation into public attitudes, really, to immigration, integration, and kind of everything in between. Um, the immigration debate has been very, very, very polarised over the last few years. Um, and what we really wanted to see was whether we could kind of start to challenge that, to start to see whether there's some common ground on immigration, and how we can actually meet a consensus and move forward, how we can actually win back some public trust on immigration, particularly kind of post-Brexit. Um, so it's a huge project, uh, and we're working alongside the Home Affairs Committee, so they're running their own investigation on immigration and everything that we find feeds into that. The idea is really that the public start to get a bit more of a voice on immigration and actually get heard by decision makers. Um, so it's got several elements, just to give you an overview. Um, it's, I've been travelling around the country quite a lot, uh, so I've been to 56 places now, um, out of 60 in total. Um, so all the way up to the Shetland Isles and all the way down to Penzance. Um, a mixture of, kind of towns, cities, rural areas. Um, and the idea is that it's a kind of political spread, it's a geographic spread, it's a mix of kind of different histories of immigration, um, all sorts of different places. Uh, and in each place we have a meeting uh, with stakeholders. Um, I think we're having about 130 meetings in total. Um, and then later we have a, what, what's called a kind of citizens panel. So there's a group of people who have recruited to be broadly representative of the local area. Um, only about 10 people because that allows us to have quite an open debate. Um, we've also got an open survey uh, where we've had about 9,000 responses so far. We'll be doing polling. Uh, we've also had, created a number of toolkits. We would have our own conversations um, and a, a few kind of partnership fringe projects as well. So it's a very, very big project um, with a lot of kind of different elements. But I mean, what I really want to talk about is what's coming out of these citizens' panels. Um, so to having these kind of in-depth discussions with normal members of the public um, on immigration and what the kind of implications of that are for Muslims in Britain as well. Um, so why do we need a national conversation on immigration? Some people would definitely say that we've talked enough about immigration, um, don't talk about much else. Um, but actually, I mean, it is the polarisation of the immigration debate and the fact that there's a lot of kind of shouty voices from both ends, but people in the middle, people who have some anxieties about immigration, perhaps, um, they might not have the same views as maybe I do, um, but it's about engaging with those people, so it's, it's really about kind of meaningful engagement on immigration. Um, people feel that the debate is quite quickly shut, shut down, um, people are quite worried about talking about immigration, worried that they might be accused of racism, um, accused that somebody else might say something racist. So really trying to kind of have a very open, more normal conversation about immigration. Make sure that people feel like they're being listened to, feel that they're being understood. Um, otherwise, really, we can start leaving the ground open to extremists. So with Hope Not Hate, our kind of target audience are people who are perhaps more ambivalent about these things, have some concerns, um, aren't kind of ready on the hardened end, um, but could quite easily swing to the right, could quite easily swing into kind of more extreme ideology. Um, so to give you kind of quite a brief overview of the findings, um, unsurprisingly again, uh, most people that we speak to have quite nuanced views on immigration, so they're more balanced. They see benefits, they also see challenges um, and problems. Um, People do kind of see the economic contribution, and people have a kind of very common sense view of economics and the economic contribution that migrants make. Um, but there are quite a lot of fears as well. Um, people want to see control, they want to see contribution. Um, control, again, we heard it all the way through the referendum. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean stopping all the immigration. Um, generally, people mean it more. Um, it kind of concerns people's fears around security. Um, and also about criminality as well. I mean, it's what people kind of see and have quite an emotive response to. Um, people really don't trust the system. Um, they really want to see greater transparency um, from politicians. They want to see cross-party working. They don't want to see immigration as this kind of inflated football um, that's being passed around. Um, people are quite skeptical about representations of migrants in the press, um, but it does definitely influence what people think as well. 
Um, but I think the most important finding that we've had so far is that immigration is often seen as this kind of national, national thing. People see them, they see this kind of unnamed mass. Um, immigration is a national problem. But what we've found is that actually people's kind of local context informs their view on immigration much more than we thought. Um, so what people see in their neighbourhoods, what people see uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, I mean, we hear a lot about kind of pressures on public housing, um, on public services, school places. Um, I mean, I was talking to someone earlier, actually. <laughs> one, of, one of the biggest things I hear about is rubbish. I mean, people kind of rubbish on the streets, rubbish in the bins. I mean, that's what people see in their day-to-day -day lives. And then that quite easily becomes transformed into a kind of cultural trope about migrants being dirty or not respecting the British way of life. Um, so I think really understanding that local lens is, is one of the ways that we can start to build consensus, start to build back public trust, um, and start to kind of change the debate as well. Um, integration as well frames a lot of how immigration is seen. Um, integration, obviously, a very, very contested term, um, and I'm not going to kind of start to enter a conversation about what it means. Um, but the way that people kind of see integration, what people perceive integration as, actually kind of informs much more of their opinion on migration as a whole and of, of kind of race and nationality as well. Um, so where people have meaningful social contact, these things are slightly different. Um, so where people kind of know their neighbours, um, know people of different backgrounds, they're much more likely to have a positive view or at least a, a kind of more nuanced understanding. Um, rather than creating a narrative from what they see in the press, mixed with this kind of local lens of what they see in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so addressing uh, is these kind of local issues, um, talking about integration, starting a kind of conversation on that as well, um, and increased communication between decision makers and the public. I mean, this is what we've kind of thought of as building a consensus. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about the relevance of this for Muslims in Britain um, because there's been a lot of stuff coming out of these conversations um, that we haven't necessarily kind of put forward yet for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but there is a lot of prejudice in our conversations and it's not necessarily Islamophobia in the way that I was anticipating um, to hear it. Um, a lot of it, I mean, we've heard the kind of Islamophobia passing the dinner table test and yes, it has in many ways, but in these conversations, what's really been very interesting to me is the way that people censor themselves and censor their prejudice towards Muslims um, in Britain. Um, there's a lot of kind of unsaid Islamophobia, so within the conversations, people will hint at things like everybody knows what they're talking about already, so they won't necessarily put things forward. Um, sometimes they'll kind of use quite different things. I mean, I had somebody in a, in a group the other day who said, oh, you know, the Asian side of things, because he thought that was a better way of talking about things than, than actually saying that he was concerned about Muslims, um, which is debatable. Um, again, the importance of context. So in places with very small migrant populations, um, so I say Trowbridge and Wiltshire, uh, or Larrick in the Shetland Isles, um, people's prejudice was quite forceful. Um, most people had never met a Muslim in their lives. Um, whereas in places like Preston and Bradford, people have a much more complex understanding of Islam in Britain and Muslims in Britain. The prejudice is still there, uh, but the way that people talk about it um, comes from a place of much more understanding. Um, again, I mean, the survey uh, responses are worth talking about as well. Um, there's a big contrast between online and offline debate. Um, the responses that we've had through this survey are on both ends of the spectrum. It's a self-selecting survey, so obviously people who are interested in this who tend to have much stronger views have taken it. Um, but across the board, Islamophobia kind of seeps in, so even amongst liberals who very passionately support the rights of refugees or whatever that kind of cause is that's driven them to take that survey, there's still concerns. There's some, sometimes kind of things on gender come up. Um, people are worried about gender inequality in Islam. So, I mean, there's, there's prejudice against Muslims that kind of seeps through um, the spectrum. Um, but most people kind of do, do shun it. Um, and again, people are willing to challenge things as well. Um, whereas online, people might not necessarily challenge things. Um, but the debate on the ground is quite different. Um, I think as well, I kind of want to talk a bit about what this means for campaigners and what it means for messaging. 
because um, I think that there's a lot from this that we can take away. Um, and there's real lessons in this for changing the narrative. Um, so I just kind of want to say, I mean, a quote from a young, we had a youth panel in Carlisle. Um, it was a, a predominantly white area, quite a poor area, um, and people were quite concerned about kind of job displacement um, because unemployment is a big problem, particularly kind of for young people there. Um, but when I was talking to this girl, I mean, she said, I try and steer clear things on the telly because I think they're very polarizing in opinion. It's either that they're going to be telling you about the dirty Muslims or they're going to be telling you about how Muslims are the best thing in the world. And I don't think either of them are right. I think that says something for campaigners about the way that we, we talk to people who might have slightly prejudiced views because this kind of polarizer and then putting forward very kind of positive visions of Islam doesn't always work, um, particularly because it doesn't resonate with people. People only really pick up on the stories on facts or whatever you want to call it that, that resonate with their view. Um, so we've got to work with a slightly different public imagination perhaps than we think we've got. Um, another thing, I mean, a lot of people that we've spoken to have been on mosque open days. Um, they found it really positive, generally. Um, but I think the kind of low-level Islamophobia that, that underlies a lot of this, people are kind of waiting um, to, to catch other people out. Um, so one person I spoke to was working as a teaching assistant. They'd gone with their school, um, which was fantastic because they were kind of reaching out beyond the kind of usual suspects that often go to these kind of events. Um, but she said that while she was kind of very pleased to learn more about Islam and more about kind of what happens within mosques that she'd previously seen as a very closed off space, she asked somebody while she was there, um, well, I'm, I've come to a mosque, would you, would you be willing to go to a church? And the person she'd spoken to had said no. And for her, that was enough to kind of close down the whole debate. Uh, it was the fact that she'd really felt that she'd really tried to make an effort to try to kind of challenge her own views. Um, that once that had been shut down, and then that becomes a kind of Chinese whisper, and that becomes passed on through communities. Um, so the, the kind of strength of ne negative encounters is huge, um, and I think there's quite a big challenge um, in how we kind of got, come, up, come about that. Um, I think as well, I mean, something about the messaging, um, quite wryly in some ways, um, there's been a lot of ridicule about stories in the press, um, about not being able to say Easter eggs or not being able to have nativity plays and so on. Um, one of the things that's really, really shocked me is the strength to which people really believe those stories. Um, I was in Grimsby for the last few days and across the board, I mean, people talk to me about no-go zones, people talk to me about, we can't even say Happy Christmas anymore. And it, you, you kind of want to laugh a bit, but actually people really, really, really believe these things to be true. People especially where there's a sense of kind of lost identity, um, particularly for people in quite deprived areas where, where industry has been lost um, and a kind of sense of purpose has been lost. These narratives of something being taken away from them permeate quite strongly and actually kind of making jokes about this is, is not going to challenge it and it's not going to, if anything, it's only going to strengthen people's prejudice there. Um, so I think in a way it's, what I kind of want to get across is the importance of actually understanding this kind of middle ground. It's not the people who are raving on the chat rooms. It's not the people who are sharing Britain First videos. It's, it's people who have prejudice um, that could actually become much worse and could become manifest in worse ways. Um, and it's the importance of actually engaging with them and meeting them kind of from where they are, using language that, that resonates with people, to then start to take them on a journey. And that's, I think, really how we start to change the narrative around this.